Thank you so much for coming. Again, my name is Jean Garboden and Amira Bakum. Um, so what we're going to do today is to talk with you. We're going to bring the voice of the elders to you. The, the elders that have had dementia and their families, those that we have learned to love and who have been our teachers over the years. So we're going to be doing a lot of storytelling to today and hopefully bring forth the wisdom and the spirit of, of, the, of the people that taught us over the years. So Amir and I met about <coughs> over over ten years ago, and um, in Eugene, Oregon. So we had we had an assisted living company at that time, um, and I needed an assistant. So Amira had just gotten married. She's pretty fresh out of college, and decided that she was going to come and uh, like to be my administrative assistant. So I looked at her resume, and she had a drama degree and a French degree, and I said, what did you want to be when you grew up? Why are you here? And she said, I want to be open to all of life's possibilities. And so I said, I want that girl with me. So we started our journey together then. And then the first week on the job. My first week on the job was literally doing nothing but making copies. <laughs> and helping everybody else figure out how to work the copy machine. Right, because we have now someone that knew technology, which we didn't, how to work the copy machine, which we didn't. Um, and so she came on, and then Amira became my elder, and my mentor, and my teacher as well on, on our journey. So we're going to start our story um, with um, the cup, first couple weeks after Amira started. And the state that we were in actually had called our company and said, there is an assisted living community in this town that is where people are suffering from abuse and neglect, and we need someone to manage this. Would you do this? And it was only a 28-unit community, so it was small, and I knew it, we might be, have a hard time finding an administrator for a community that small. Um, so I thought, well, maybe we should, we should try it out. Let, let me go check it out and see if it's something I want. Because I, what I did know about that building, they had been in the paper for abuse and neglect. They, uh, they had a barbed wire around the back fence to keep people from getting out. Uh, I, knew that, I knew that there were problems going on there. I didn't know if we wanted to take it on or not. But I had a friend that lived about a couple of hours away that was an assistant administrator in assisted living for eight years. And I called her and I said, hey, would you like to be an administrator? You would be amazing. Um, it's, it's a couple hour drive away, and I told her about the community. And she said, yes, I'll come up right now and we'll go over and look at it. Look at it. At this point, I had not seen the building. I had not been in it. So when she, her name is Tammy. So when she came, we drove over there together. It was about 6 o'clock at night, just getting dark. And we um, went inside the building. And we were struck that moment that we walked in with the smell of urine and feces and vomit and people screaming, help me, help me. And then these odd high-pitched sounds like, woo, 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 just going throughout the building. We walked in, there was a lady sitting at the table, right, as we walked in with a pills on the, um, in a pill cup and some on the floor, and there were no employees around. As we walked on through the building, we saw coming down the hall a little tiny lady with her hair all disheveled, and she had long black fingernails, and she couldn't talk, but she was just walking like this, and she was making this sound like, woo, 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 walking towards us. It was terrifying, <laughs> and we still could find no employees in the building. We finally walked outside, and we found some employees in the smoke, smoking area. And they said, oh, are you the people that's going to take over the management of this building? And I said, I don't know. We're just checking it out now. And they said, if you do, let me tell you something. There is a woman in there that bites. She has no teeth, but she can bite us. She kicks, she screams, and she smears poop all over the walls. You need to get rid of her. Tammy and I, by this time, were holding hands, and we, I did not want to let go of it. We turned and walked back in the building, and again, we saw that little lady walking toward us. Um, but we just ran out. <laughs> I stood outside, and I could not even look at Tammy. I, I, I said, Tammy, I am so sorry. I did not know 
that it was going to be like this. I'm sorry you drove all the way up here. I understand that she said stop. And I looked at her and there were tears coming down her face and she said, they need me. They need me. And so we decided to take on the challenge of this building. And that's when we began to learn things that we never thought we would have an opportunity to learn. Amira came in about two weeks after that, right? <coughs> we had just opened the building, and she came in and helped us on this journey. So about a week later, Tammy and I walked into the building, and as soon as it still was the same way, but we had this courage that we, we they need us, they need us. Um, and we walked in, and there was that little lady doing this, and she had poop all over her, and Tammy just knew what to do. She didn't have any of the training I'm going to talk about to today, but some people have a knack of what to do. So she walked up to her, could you leave her? She walked up to her, no, yeah, not walked up to her. <laughs> and, but I know you can't imagine poop all over her, but we had poop on Tammy, grabbed, grabbed her by the face, and said, I love you, I love you, and pulled her close. It didn't matter to Tammy, it didn't matter to Tammy, but Tammy knew instinctively that every human being needs love. Did you flip the slide? So this is, this, this is the lady right here, I don't know if you can see it, that light above us. So her name is Madeline, and um, she was 92 years old when we met her, and she was the inspiration for us to find our way. What we found out was that she was a grandmother of 13 children, and that she had no family in this town. Um, she had no teeth, so the doctor had ordered Insure, and, but they, the employees never gave her anything to eat. If you have no teeth, you can eat mashed potatoes, you can eat soft food, but that caused continual diarrhea. So she was continually having poop issues. Um, we also found out that she was on over 20 medications and 12 of them were psychotropics. Oh, and she was not crazy. She was 92 years old. So we knew when we walked in there that this woman was going to be our teacher and our guide. So what do you think happened to those two employees that we <laughs> were to find another job? Yeah. I did. So <laughs> I, asked them, I asked them to leave, but you know, over the years, as we have learned, we have learned so much, I'm thinking maybe they just didn't know. Maybe they had no one to teach them. Maybe no one, maybe they had good, well-intentioned hearts, but no one taught them. So sometimes I wish I could look them up and find them and say, let me teach you. But I did what I felt like I had to do at that time. So we actually placed most of the buildings in more appropriate placement. Uh, there were homeless people and mental health issues in the building with older people, which was not a good thing. And we ended up, we only had seven people left in the building, and one of them was Madeline. So the, the employees had asked me to get rid of her, but she was one that, that was left there with us. Um, over the years, we be, over the few, next few months, we began studying, we began learning about uh, what we could do to help someone like Madeline. Because the big thing was, I started reading books like um, Learning to Speak Alzheimer's, which is a really good book. But in most of the books, it was saying as people get dementia that they lose themselves. But I could look in Madeline's face and she was in there. She just couldn't communicate to us. She was still a whole capable person. And so we started searching for a way to be able to connect with her and for her to connect with us, and we were hoping we could help her find a voice. So, as Madeline walked up and down the halls, she remember she had a drama degree. <laughs> walked up and down the halls. I never thought I'd be using it for this. <laughs> so one of the employees then just started doing the same thing she was along with her. And then Madeline made a connection with us. So this is called mirroring. We learn later, if you mirror the behavior, that pretty, it's not making fun of them, it's just doing what they're doing, that they can build a connection, which that was pretty amazing. Um, and then we realized that she loved the old gospel music when the gospel band came and she would clap to the music. She couldn't 
talk or speak, but she couldn't really do that. So we tried something else. So when she was walking along, we were nearing, we started doing this. You are my sunshine, you are my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. All of a sudden, the music stimulated something in her and made she could do the cadence with the music. So after, so we kept trying to communicate with her in that way. Um, and as we uh, learned more about her, we recognized that um, that she totally was there. She just couldn't talk. So we began studying uh, something called the Eden Alternative, and I am an Eden Alternative educator. And we learned from Dr. Bill Thomas that um, elders are dying of loneliness, helplessness, and boredom. You can heal COPD, or fix and not heal it, but you can treat COPD, you can treat other illnesses, but really it's the plagues of the spirit that people are dying from. And so we learned about person-centered care, so we let we let her have a choice, and we worked very closely with her. We learned a lot. What, here's a big thing that we learned on the next slide. Some, uh, this is from Milton Mayerhoff, he's a, a, a psychiatrist. We sometimes speak as if caring does not require knowledge, like everyone cares. Uh, many of you in this room are caregivers of someone, but we, we talk like it, you, know, you just need to have a big heart as if caring for someone is simply a matter of good intentions and warm regard. But to care, I must understand the other's needs. I must understand them, I must know them, and be able to respond properly to them. And clearly good intentions do not guarantee this. As we saw from those two caregivers that probably came into the industry with big hearts but didn't know what to do. To care for someone, we must know many things. So we began intensely educating our caregivers. One of the big things we learned is uh, Maslow's, anyone seen this before, Maslow's hierarchy? Okay, if you're a nurse or um, it takes psychology or uh, you probably are a teacher, you probably have this. So all human beings, and you also have it in your hand up, um, need these things in order to, to grow. So think back to Madeline. Uh, Maslow did this hierarchy back in 1943 as a paper of basic human needs. The very basic of human needs is physiological. We need to go to the bathroom, we need to sleep, we need to eat. Those physiological needs are made. Did Madeline have even her physiological needs met? No, she didn't. So that basic human need was not met for her. The next is safety and security. Safety, that they're, they're, did you think she felt safe in that environment? Why do you think she was kicking and screaming and biting? She did, she did not feel safe. So the first physiological need and safety needs, and this all human beings need or you will die. <coughs> the next is love and belonging. A feeling of friendship and family and love. She didn't have that, did she? At all. Until Tammy walked up to her and said, Madeline, I love you. That moment, Madeline began to heal. And the next is self-esteem. So all of us have a need for self-esteem. So she was the grandmother of 13. She was a master gardener. She was the grandmother of the entire neighborhood. And was she being treated with honor and self-esteem? So all of these things are, were not met for her. And I really, she lived five more years after we got there, but I believe if we had not arrived, she would not have, and I think, we arrived at the right time. I think things don't, ha they don't happen by accident. We arrived at the right time for her to teach us and for us to love her. So that this is for all of us. All of us need a physiological safety, love, belonging, and self-esteem so we can self-actualize. And that means so that we can be our highest self because everyone wants to die in peace. And so there's the, if, so we as caregivers and the hospice people were right there with us, um, if we can make sure these needs are met, physiological, safety and security, love and belonging, self-esteem, then we can help, especially in the blind, we can help people come to their highest actualization. I think of us as kind of like life doulas or 
like almost like midwifing people from from this life into their next great adventure. And we and they can they um, that's what we were really trying to do. When we learned about this, it was like this is what we're going to do for Madeline. So on the next slide, we actually talked about our caregivers too, and you and me. So all of us have our physiological needs, which are the basic stuff. You know, we can go shopping, and we can, and we do it by here, right here is where we are. We're all working to get the basic stuff, right? And hopefully at work, we feel love and belonging with our care team members. And self-esteem is now, you know what I'm doing? More work. And we do it so we can do what we want to do. So all of us have a basic human need for all of these things to be to self-actualize and be the greatest human being you can be. And we as caregivers have the opportunity to help people who can't do it for themselves to be the greatest human beings they can be. All we're talking about is love. All this triangle is love. And at, at work, it seems kind of weird to go around and say, you need to love each other. I say that to our care team members. I say it to family. You need to love each other. That's what it's all about. But if we can meet all of these physiological safety and health needs and inclusion, it's all about love. And we're going to go to the next slide. Did everyone stand up? <laughs>
Eventually, the plaques and tangles erase a person's oldest and most precious memories, which are stored here in the back of the brain. Near the end, the disease compromises the person's balance and coordination. And in the very last stage, it destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing and the heart. The progression from mild forgetting to death is slow and steady and takes place over an average of eight to 10 years. It is relentless and, for now, incurable. Helping your family, friends, and neighbors to better understand Alzheimer's will reduce stigma, improve care, and even help the fight for a cure. Thanks for helping to do your part. Learn more at www.aboutalz.org. So we had to face the fact that there was something going wrong in Madeline's brain that we could not cure. We were like, we're going to save Madeline. But we realized we needed to educate ourselves, and so we really started studying the brain and trying to figure out not can we cure her, but can we help her have her voice back so that she can tell us she loves us every time we, how can we do that? So that was really our mission. We really started studying the brain. So did you notice in that, in that video how the, the Alzheimer's went around the next third and back? Well, oh, oh, put your hands like this. Put your thumbs inside and close your hands and put them together like this, like it's a little heart. Think of that as the brain. The thumb is the limbic brain. The outside is the rest of the brain. So the limbic brain is the very last thing that is to go. It's protected, actually, by this top part of the brain where the damage is happening. In that limbic brain, there is emotion. There is the ability to love. There is ability to connect. There is the, well, you can spark that part of the limbic brain with music, as we found out with Madeline, and it can help people come to themselves for a bit so that we could connect even for a moment. So that limbic brain, which is in here, it's in all of our brains, it's in your head, it's like right in the middle, that is, that is there. So even until the end of life, they can love and they can connect with us and they know we are there and that they are full capable human beings just without the ability to communicate because that brain got all messed up. So the limbic system is right here. And like I said, it can feel love, it can feel emotion. And we, you know, we knew that. We weren't educated on this, but we knew that when we told Madeline we loved her, that she loved us, even if she couldn't say it. We knew we were connecting. We knew when the music came on that she, something sparked in here, and for a moment, she could feel herself. So let's go to the next thing. So we really need to understand, so you'll tap this and it'll make things pop up. We're just gonna tap it. So dementia, how many of you have heard of the word dementia? So when people say dementia, when doctors say someone has dementia, I'm like, what kind of dementia? Because you can have dementia if you get dehydrated or if you get a urinary tract infection. So what are the, so dementia is simply a symptom. There's all kinds of dementia. Some dementias are curable and some are not. So that's what I want to talk about now. Dementia is just a description of a symptom. So one of the symptoms is memory. And so you may forget things, but if I forget where I park my car, as long as I know what these keys are for, I'm okay. So people always say, oh, you know, I'm, what, what Dr. Uh, Thomas in the, the Edom, email turned and said is that as we get older, people think you're starting, you know, sometimes you're 50 or 40 and people say, I've had a senior moment. Um, but actually you have so much information in your head that it takes a longer time for the brain to ch -ch 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 go in there and find it. And then eventually, oh, I remember, you got it. So I never say I have a senior moment. I say just a moment, I remember it. <laughs> we don't want that self-fulfilling prophecy that just because we forget things or can't recall it as quickly when we're older, that means that we're starting to get dementia. That, 
that can be a case, but uh, there is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If people think it, you know, it's like then they think everything is going wrong. But memory is one of the symptoms. The other is orientation. I don't know what city I'm in right now or what room I am, or I get lost when I drive or when I walk somewhere. That's orientation. Another is language. There's something called confabulation, which means you think you're saying one thing and you say something else. So if I might say, um, I, I want to go on the train, but you meant I want to go on the car, because some of those words got kind of mixed up in there. So it's language. Judgment is another one. I had a 97-year-old friend that called a taxi to take her to the car place, and she bought a new car, and drove it back, and it's like, oh, I, I forgot I don't have a driver's license. It took a lot to get that money back from the car dealer, but yeah. So judgment sometimes. Perception. So perception uh, in how you see things because the eyes change. So one thing that happens in the brain is that your vision becomes um, called binocular vision. So look at me like this, like through binoculars. Look, look at your someone at the table like this. Look at each other. So you can't see things up or down or on the side. See? So someone with, with dementia, they can only see that. If someone taps them on the shoulder, they might get a get afraid because they can only see a certain way. And that's why there's falls often as well. Um, another one is concentration. I start a sentence and I can't uh, complete it. And the other is task sequencing. So I can't I get up and put my clothes on and I put my um, my shoes on and my pants on and then put my shorts on or pants on or whatever. So you just don't you forget how to sequence things. But those are all symptoms of dementia. There are, go ahead, go We plan this. Yeah. Um, there are two kinds of dementia. One are the irreversible, and these are things like Madeline had that we could not get rid of. Alzheimer's, you've heard of. We talked a little bit about on that video and how that goes. There's one called mad cow disease. It's not much in the United States, but the quick uh, de deterioration of the brain from eating um, beef that is contaminated. You hear about it more in Europe. multi infarct or vascular dementia from having a stroke it can cause some damage in the brain. Uh, Pick's disease is the one with social etiquette. It's a frontal lobe. So uh, someone might say, you're ugly. Or, you know, they just know social etiquette. They just, just say, this, they, they don't, because that part's gone. <laughs> Uh, Lewy body disease, it comes with hallucinations, usually hallucinations of animals or people. And so they actually really see animals or people. And uh, sometimes if, when I'm working with someone like that, I just see it along with them. You know, just enter their, their reality because it's very real to them. It's not often scary, but they actually see things. Uh, Huntington's disease is the early onset Alzheimer's. You might have heard of this, but it's genetic. So people in their 30s and 40s uh, get Alzheimer's. Um, it's usually a family genetic thing, and it usually goes fairly quickly. Um, AIDS can cause dementia. Parkinson's, like uh, Michael J. Fox has that. Um, so it's a stiffness of the body, and, it's, and the dementia comes usually at the end, and sometimes they don't get dementia at all. But that is one of the side effects of Parkinson's. And then Korsakoff syndrome is from alcoholism. And uh, that was a very interesting. I met a man, total, carried on a conversation with him. I said, he's OK. But then, so he carried on a conversation, but he could not remember he had a conversation that came again. So that's interesting how your brain is affected so many ways. And all of these can cause one or more of those symptoms of dementia that you saw. So I told my kids. The doctor who tells you mom has dementia, ask them what kind. Because maybe, maybe, it's a reversible dementia that can be fixed. So, if you have a thyroid disorder and it's not treated, it can cause symptoms of dementia. You fix it by taking your thyroid medication. Drug or medication interactions. Interestingly, a lot of the medication that are, are prescribed by physicians um, do cause um, a really strong symptom of uh, dementia. So it almost looks like Alzheimer's. Um, so it's really, here's one rule for you. You don't get dementia overnight. If you're fine today and tomorrow you have dementia, it's probably a reversible dementia. Um, dehydration, just not getting enough water. 
Um, even depression and stress. I had a friend that just said she was forgetting things and there was a lot going on in her life and it was some of the symptoms of dementia that she just had stress. An infection um, could be like a urinary tract infection or some chronic infection inside your body. Um, and that's what I tell my kids too. If all of a sudden, you know, check to make sure I don't have a urinary tract infection before you put me away. I went to one community um, in Wisconsin and there was a lady in there that I met and she was saying, why am I in here? I was sick, I went to the doctors, and I was in the hospital, and then they brought me back here, not to my apartment. And so she was totally fine, but the doctor had misdiagnosed and said, she has dementia now, so she needs to go to a memory care. And she didn't, so she was very happy the day that I opened the doors for her. <laughs> so that's another thing, be careful. Doctors are really, good, but not all doctors have a, a lot of understanding of dementia, so we need to educate ourselves. Um, lack of sleep, I travel a lot. Sometimes I get up and I don't know what town I'm in or where the bathroom is in the hotel room, and then I have this, uh, what was that, symptom of disorientation. So uh, lack of sleep can really cause the same symptom. A metabolic disorder, brain tumor, or uh, even tacoma, all of these can be corrected. All of them. And I think that's important to know. So if anyone's you love or, or anyone tells you you have dementia, ask what kind of it. And then that will make, make them get a little further. Music sparks that limbic brain. When I first met him, he was very isolated. They start to feel very disconnected from their lives, from who they've always been. If you can imagine somebody who hasn't recognized their loved one in five or six years, you know, I've been strong for four years. I just can't take it anymore. Music can do things which language can't. When I learned that the, what a 90% of uh, a resident's time is spent idle, um, so let's try this and see what difference the uh, iPod has made. I have one resident that didn't open to I, she didn't respond. Nothing worked. It was amazing once we put the iPod on her. She started shaking her feet, getting her arm. <laughs> I'm seeing her all over again. I'm going to take the music for one second, okay? Just to ask you a few questions. Okay? Yes, sir, no questions. What, what does music do, do to you? It gives me this feeling of love. No, no man. Think right now the world needs to come into music saying, <laughs> you got beautiful music in. Beautiful, we all love it. And there are a few bands of love, dream. Music therapy now says it's something very powerful to play. It's a work. This hard part keeps me happy. It keeps me from crying. And when I'm upset, all I do is take out my music. And it soothes my nerves, and I go back to sleep. And with an average cost of about $80, um, this is less than most people's daily medication costs terms of what difference it makes for the quality of life for an individual who's able to receive this uh, is just immeasurable. So uh, for me, uh, I can't think of any greater than that. Dr. Oliver Sacks, which was all of his uh, neuroscientists, he started studying the effects of music on the limbic brain for those living with dementia. And they went around to their homes across the United States. And I um, followed that documentary up until they released the book, the movie called The Line Inside. It's also a book. And so we followed that. And we actually started practicing that with our with our elders. So we would uh, 
find out their, their tunes that they have. We would download them. I had to get I didn't know how to do that at the time, so I found a 20-year-old to help me download iTunes. So we would interview the residents for um, the um, or, or their family. Um, the music between the ages of eight and twenty five is usually the music that sticks in that in that part of the brain. Uh, so we interviewed them, we put the earphones on them and then took them off. And some of them that could that not that didn't talk or, or didn't want to talk, I don't know. When we started interviewing them, they started talking about the memories that were evoked by that music. Um, in one community I went to, there was a man that had what's called a, a salad language. It's all mixed up like a salad. Um, so I called his daughter and she told me the songs he likes. And this was new. I just watched this documentary. I had the care team in a circle and we, I started talking to them about this uh, possibility. Um, and he sat in a circle with us with the earphones on. He was kind of like, you know, pointing, singing, not, you know. We took them off and he spoke in clear, complete sentences when we talked with him. We all started crying. It doesn't, it doesn't cure anyone, but for that moment and that time that he was able to feel the wholeness of himself. So again, um, so what we are doing is that in any of our memory cares, and even if uh, someone uh, we went to another building where just elder people that didn't have any memory issues, we did the music with them and it helped. If you can't walk, it gives you a sense of movement. And if you are stressed, it relaxes you. This, it has to be their tune. Uh, so it was amazing. We kept looking at that limbic brain and we learned that aromatherapy actually stimulates that limbic brain. And if you think about it, here's the nose, here's the limbic brain right here. And the through the olfactory bulb, the aroma is sent directly to the center of the brain into the limbic system. And where it's processed, it releases some neurochemicals. So sometimes we do the combination of music and little aromatherapy in the room. We maybe put, in the morning, put um, music, the oldies in the morning, uh, noon, do some um, big band, and evening maybe yo-yo ma or some string music in the evening. And it's amazing how the music and the aromas can calm the, the individual. And I know that you are filming over there. I'm walking back and forth, all right? <laughs> So, uh, just one more slide here. So, what is your perception when you see this? Which of these are the larger? Which of these are larger? Which one looks larger? Right. So, they're both the same, and this is an example of when the space surrounding digits deceive our eyes. So, what happens when uh, people have some type of dementia or memory loss or brain damage, they, their perception is different. And every one of us in this room can have a different perception, even with totally healthy brains. Let's see the next one. What do you see here? Someone saw a duck? Someone saw a duck? It's a duck or a rabbit. just depends on your perception. So all of us, are, as human beings, we have different perceptions. When that is complicated with damage to the brain, you can imagine how what a confusing world it is. So Amir, I'm going to give you, well, I think you have time for, to introduce them there. Yeah. yeah. So Amir has another image for you. Hmm. What do you see in this one? <laughs> you and me. You and me. Yeah, different people see different things. Um, somebody, we, uh, we actually were able to do this, uh, a shorter version of this course at the Oregon Healthcare Association Conference and somebody shouted from the back of the room, there's about 150 people, and somebody said, JOY! And I said, what? Now I see JOY going up. And I had never seen that before. I looked at this about 50 times or more and I had never seen that before. I thought that was completely amazing that one person saw something completely different than what anybody else had ever seen. Um, which just I think further illustrates the point that some people are truly unique. Uh, <laughs> but, um, oops, sorry. Um, but, so I want to introduce, um, based on that, if we're all unique individuals and we all see things in different ways, how do we communicate with people who are all different? 
each individual that we communicate with is different, and we're all different. So how are we going to do this? So there's three things that, or so one of the things that we, um, when we started down this journey, you'll hear a little bit more about, um, about a woman named Naomi File that we actually started studying, reading her books. This is one of her books, actually, The Validation Breakthrough. And started learning that uh, empathy had a big part of this. Now, most caregivers are really good at empathy because they really feel, or at least have compassion, they feel for these people that they're caring for. Um, but there's three keys to communicating with empathy that we found. So the first is to be non-judgmental. Sometimes I, I teach our staff to, to physically, physically take your judgment cap and take it off. Take your little judgment cap and remove it because it's really hard to judge. We all love to judge as human beings. We just do, it's in our nature. Um, but we have to learn how to be non-judgmental. And we need to know the person as a unique individual. We need to know who this person is. Who is Sally and Bill? And who's Renee and Faye and Ken? Who are these people? What are they like? Who and, and who? What drives them as individuals? Um, and then the third part was to, is to reflect and feel the emotion of the other person. And this can be a really scary thing because people think, what if somebody's angry? Do I have to be angry back? And then is that going to ruin my whole day because I'm angry now too? Because I was feeling what they're feeling? <coughs> Not necessarily. We're going to learn how to do that a little bit because it, you don't have to take on the emotion. You can feel and reflect that emotion without taking it on from someone else. And it takes practice. It's a lot of practice, but it is possible. So in this video, we're going to, um, this is Peacock, and this is how I want to introduce it. Oh, that's right. Um, so just to introduce the video, it's, um, this is by a TED, a TED Talk that was illustrated by Brene Brown. And Brene Brown is a sociologist. She's done lots of TED Talks. She's written books. Um, and she, I think, this is probably one of the best illustrations of what empathy is because most people think they know what empathy is, but confuse it with sympathy, right? Oh, oh, I, I totally know what you're going through. Yeah, of course, sure. Yeah, let's go shopping, right? I mean, she explains it, I think, the best, so I'll let, the, let her do the talking. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy. Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think that empathy is this kind of sacred space where someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Uh, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I have it, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So, I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult 
conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now, I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. And love. Right? Connection and love. Um, and what... The last little bit of what she says there, I think, is, some, is one of the best takeaways I've ever had in that. Rarely does something that you say make something better, but it's a connection. So if we're working with people, or we're trying to communicate with someone who can't verbally communicate, then we don't have to say anything. We don't have to. It's not about what we're saying at that point. It's about that connection that we're making. Do you want to take a quick break? I want to tell them one thing about Naomi Bible and we'll take Okay. So um, before we go through the rest of this, I, Naomi Bible actually kind of changed our lives. Um, she's from Cleveland, Ohio. She grew up in an old folks home. When we met her, she was 80, and that was like 15 years ago. Well, <laughs> 15 years ago. <laughs> uh, she travels all over Europe talking about validation and connecting with empathy with people. Have any of you heard of Naomi Bio? Okay, you have, yeah. So um, we had studied her on our little group in, the, in this community where Mama was. We had studied her. And we got so excited because um, she was telling how we could communicate with Madeline. Uh, so one day our receptionist got a phone call, and it was a man that said, Could my mom come and do a documentary in your place? And she said, Well, who's your mom? And he said, Naomi Bio. It's like, oh my gosh, she was visiting her son in that city. And so we said, sure. And I'm telling you that she's about this tall. When she walked in, I was like, I thought she was a rock star. Um, and she told the camera crew, come over here. Jane's been about to give us a commercial now. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but for six months, she was in the community where Madeline lived and worked with our elders and did create a documentary um, that's about 20 minutes long about um, her work with those that have dementia. And I'm going to tell you the rest of the story right now. At the end, uh, at, by the time Naomi left our community, Madeline had gained her voice. So what we're going to teach you helped this with Madeline. So at the end of her life, like I said, she lived another five years. So she didn't come fully to her voice, but she could say in her little voice, I love you. <laughs> and she, she could say that. And she could say yes and no and make her needs known verbally. And we were so excited. So at the end of her life, we were able to surround her with love, bring the music into her, turn on our aromatherapy, and talk with her and tell her, Madeline, we love you. And she could say, I love you. <laughs> so she had the opportunity to die in peace. And we had the opportunity to be the conduits through our passion for learning for her. And so it's, I just want to tell you right now that Madeline is very with us. And uh, she's the one that has taught us and that helps us have hope for others that we can connect with as we have with her. So we're going to take a break. And you're going to hear Naomi talk. And she's going to tell you um, about her theory that those that, can, that we can connect with any human being through empathy, which is through the, the in the living brain, which we were so excited that we learned about that living brain. So take seven minutes. Take just a, there's a bathroom here, walk outside, you call a stretch right? And, and in this, Amira's going to show you how to do it. So you get to hear from Naomi and then 